so thank you very much for the invitation and uh, giving the opportunity to to share some uh, thoughts and results regarding um, interbrain synchronization. So it's a great pleasure to to be in this uh, Sapien Lab symposium uh, today. The the idea is to briefly present some uh, core results of these new fields of hyperscanning EEG and all the related topics uh, of interbrain synchronization and specifically how we have seen a lot of neurobehavioral correlates of social interaction until uh, now. And I, I will briefly explain how we may move to causal explanation in the future. So uh, I want to thank first all my collaborators and the uh, fundings that allowed uh, those research to, to be done and working on social interaction. I'm a big fan of the Ubuntu word of I am because you are and all this work uh, would not have been possible if uh, there is no uh, collaboration intensively in science. So, and before talking about interbrain synchronization, I wanted also to talk about briefly about intrabrain synchronization uh, which is now something that has been uh, quite extensively studied in, in neuroscience, but um, compared to the, 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 the study of the, the human brain, it's quite recently that uh, the community have understood how the brain is a peer-to-peer -peer network, so to say, and how synchronization is a dynamical phenomenon that correspond to the functional uh, integration of information of di distant uh, brain region. And that's like seeing how the brain operates in a more distributed fashion and synchronization one is one of the mechanisms that allow the communication uh, in this distributed uh, network. And uh, I, I've, I had the chance to do my, my PhD in the former lab of Francisco Varela, who was one of the, the proponents of this uh, uh, dynamical network view of the human brain, studying that with MEG and, and EEG. And uh, in their uh, brain web paper in 2001, they were like one of the first to, to use this peer-to-peer -peer network metaphor for the brain, which is now kind of, uh, in the area of Bitcoin, uh, quite uh, aligned with the fact that we compare our uh, the brain usually with the most advanced technological artifact of our time. So it's very funny to reflect on that. Uh, so beyond the in, intra-brain and dynamical neuroscience revolution, uh, there is another one uh, in social neuroscience. Uh, some call it the interactive turn of neuroscience, which has been to take more seriously social interaction in the constitution of individual cognition. Uh, and it's kind of related to also uh, embodied cognition and uh, an active approach such as the one that Varela uh, developed actually. And, but uh, even outside this uh, circle of interactionism and activism, uh, it, it has become like quite uh, commonly accepted that indeed we, we need to take seriously social interaction to understand the human human cognition. And well, uh, coming indeed from a more in, act, in action and embodied cognition, uh, the idea is that with this sensory motor coupling of uh, a cognitive agent with the environment, when you are coupled with another person through social interaction, the idea is you would expect to measure uh, interbrain synchronization because of this uh, coupling between two uh, systems that are dynamically uh, already generating intrabrain synchrony. But since they are coupled with perception and action and mutually anticipating and being uh, the stimulus and the, the response uh, to the, each other uh, enter in resonance, so to say. But uh, so that's more like a theoretical uh, hypothesis. And the problem is uh, in neuroscience, people have 
paradoxically study the social brain from a very isolated individual individualistic uh, point of view and uh, as uh, stated by Schilbach and colleague uh, a decade ago well the social interaction and the brain actively engage in interaction especially for instance two individuals en engage in dynamical interaction so online social cognition was quite a dark matter of neuroscience there were not so much studied there and there are many reasons behind that so like uh, a focus on individualistic uh, cognitive uh, aspect but also uh, some technical limitation uh, to record multiple brains simultaneously and uh, I have been like working on operationalizing this naturalization of social interaction for more than 10 years now uh, with different methods ranging from empirical recording of uh, mutual brain in, in, in interaction to uh, dyadic uh, neurocomputational models and even human uh, machine interaction but today we're going to focus on hyperscanning EEG so the, the the recording of two people or more in EEG uh, during social interaction and the term hyperscanning actually was coined uh, by uh, Reed Montague um, at that time working with fMRI so that's where the scanning come from because in EEG we are not really scanning per se but um, and Reed Montague was quite uh, visionary in in this paper in 2002 proposing not only to record two or more uh, people with fMRI but also uh, discussing the fact of having cross-channel feedback and we're going to come back to that later but hyper neurofeedback is uh, something that could be achieved now more easily and uh, could lead to more causal explanation of uh, interbrain synchronization but it was already uh, explained in a theoretical sense in this uh, very uh, um, pioneering work and to also uh, recognize uh, earlier uh, visionary work so developmental psychology has been uh, doing behavioral hyperscanning so I, I, I voluntarily use uh, very uh, neologistic uh, terminology but to explain that well in developmental psychology people were already uh, working on mutual interaction and using video to assess for instance in, in the case of uh, uh, Jacqueline Nadel work showing for instance that three months old kid are able to decipher and distinguish uh, a live video or a pre-recorded video of their parents thus assessing that already at three months old we have the neural um, uh, neural mechanisms allowing to detect this very fine grain uh, dynamical aspects of uh, social cognition and what we did uh, is to collaborate with the team of Jacqueline Nadel and uh, uh, use the same dual video but adding the hyperscanning EEG system to understand what was going on uh, at the fine grain dynamical level in the brain uh, in respect to these fine grain dynamics at the behavioral level. And we first uh, identify at the intrabrain level uh, already something very interesting showing that social neuroscience should indeed take seriously a social interaction um, which is that the brain and the neural correlates of social cognition during an active uh, social interaction and an active social exchange are different from a more passive social perception of uh, stimuli for instance emotion and so on and it's go even deeper than that uh, because the the role the social role you are taking and the social context the interaction unfold also condition the neural dynamics that you're observing and especially we identified and that was nice because we we showed this double dissociation uh, in fMRI as well we show that in the case of spontaneous interaction which is more like the the classic daily life interaction we have with other people uh, there is a co-ownership of the ongoing 
behavior at the dyadic level. And there is like a symmetrical uh, neural correlates of this co-ownership of the ongoing action. So that's at the intra-brain level, but this uh, symmetrical neural correlate of spontaneous interaction was then assessed also with phase uh, neural phase synchronization. And so we demonstrated that the intra-brain synchronization that I was explaining earlier um, that were like associated with the integration of information between different brain area, actually we observe also similar interbrain synchronization uh, demonstrating the integration of information between two different brains. And in that case, uh, in a symmetric fashion uh, regarding the alpha mu uh, lower frequency band and uh, involving uh, right temporal parietal area that have been widely uh, studied in social neuroscience regarding uh, perception of biological motion and even uh, going to uh, uh, mentalizing and more advanced social cognitive function, but we, we're going to go back to that. And in higher frequency band, uh, in asymmetric uh, synchronization with more frontal area in the person that is the model or the leader of the interaction and more uh, posterior area in the imitator or the follower of the interaction. And so, well, that was one of the first uh, assessment of spontaneous uh, interaction uh, in uh, hyperscanning. And we moved then from the nonverbal context we also demonstrate that this interbrain synchronization exists also in the language uh, interaction and uh, with Alejandro Perez and with uh, the, the team of uh, Shamit Suri with uh, my colleague Pavel Goldstein. We even demonstrate that affective touch would, would lead also to interbrain synchronization. And in that case, in this paper, what is very uh, beautiful beyond the the fact that we assess that indeed affective touch has a, a reduction of pain uh, and there is a physiological correlate to that, uh, the, the, the interesting aspect for interbrain synchronization research is that the um, affective touch is arrhythmic. So it discarded the idea that interbrain synchronization is just a reflection of mutual entrainment of rhythmic behavior. And so in arrhythmic social uh, behavior, we also have interbrain synchronization. And more recently, with the team of Ruth Feldman, so with uh, uh, Jaklowski, we also uh, demonstrated that even higher order social psychology uh, dimensions, such as human attachment, so comparing uh, stranger, best friends, and romantic couple. Uh, modulates and shape this interbrain synchronization pattern depending on the task that you are doing. So, for instance, in the case of motor task, this is more like uh, proportional to your level of attachment to the other person. While for empathy giving, you have a nonlinear relationship uh, where actually romantic couples, for instance, have a, a different mode of coupling with the other person because they have internalized a model of uh, the other in a different way than friends or stranger. So that's like more empirical results with more correlates. And the challenge for the future uh, are first to go beyond those dyadic interaction. And my uh, friend, uh, Susan Dicker, uh, we will, I'm, I'm collaborating now uh, at Pioneer, this uh, group hyperscanning uh, recordings, especially for instance in the case of classroom recording, to show how uh, hyperscanning and interbrain synchronization can be a proxy to study joint attention in groups, but also other phenomena that are not that easy to uh, naturalize in social psychology. And uh, in the case of uh, mechanistic understanding, uh, another challenge that has been already advanced with, uh, for instance, the team of Wei Wong in UCLA is to study interbrain synchronization in uh, animals model. And uh, 
they demonstrate, for instance, uh, in pairs of mice, that interbrain synchronization can be assessed at the cellular level. So that's really demonstrating uh, that those interbrain phenomena are not uh, just epiphenomenon of methodology, for instance. And I, I didn't have time to, to discuss much, but you, you, for those who are not realizing, at the beginning, uh, um, this field was almost uh, associated with uh, parapsychology, and I even have been attacked earlier in my master thesis to do parapsychology by doing this thing. So it's very uh, a long journey since then, and having now papers in cell or in nature neuroscience showing that there is indeed interbrain synchronization, and our, we are now understanding the underlying biological mechanism is quite uh, uh, thrilling now to, 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 to see. So there is a, a huge uh, growing interest uh, in, in those uh, multi-brain neuroscience. So you see the Montague 2002 paper, and since then, like a, a huge increase in number of publication with hyperscanning. I put the 1965 because uh, at that time, there were like a, a science paper using hyperscanning in EEG that remained in the in the archive because it's, it was about telepathy. So maybe this parapsychology uh, fear and uh, confounding effect was uh, associated with this paper in 1965. But anyway, it has changed. And so now we have with colleagues like uh, Alejandro Perez or Paolo Barraza, uh, we, we have written like uh, how to um, and uh, methodological paper to explain to people how to set up their own hyperscanning uh, set up uh, in their lab, and I have initiated a, a Python library so to standardize and help uh, multi-brain neuroscience researcher for their uh, statistical visualization and uh, analysis in general um, using a, a standardized uh, Python open source library. So to finish, like just uh, mentioning how we can get from this correlates to causality. Uh, my colleague, uh, Giacomo Novembre, uh, has been pioneering the, the field of multibrain stimulation using uh, um, alternative current stimulation. And uh, in, in this piece recently in Trends in Cognitive Science, he argued with Yanetti that hyperscanning only cannot prove causal uh, relationship and just uh, multibrain stimulation can. And he has already uh, pioneered this in human in 2017, showing preliminary work, demonstrating that stimulating in phase two brains tend to um, facilitate synchronization at the behavioral level. And more recently in nature neuroscience, there, there have been a quite a technological tour de force showing in uh, up to three mice uh, simultaneously uh, direct a causal effect on social behavior by stimulating either at the same frequency or different frequency their prefrontal cortex using optogenetics. So uh, in line with the, the pioneering work of uh, Wei Hong, Hong uh, here we have like a, a, the pioneering work in, in animal with multiple brain stimulation. And what we argue with uh, uh, my postdoc, Kant Amaro, who just uh, joined the lab yesterday, so it's very fresh, but uh, we, we started to uh, work uh, earlier, and we answered to uh, November and Yanetti in, in Trends in Cognitive Science. We think that there are other ways than multi-brain synchronization uh, stimulation for assessing explanation, and we argue that explanation beyond causality is what multi-brain neuroscience need. Uh, first, using uh, cross-channel feedback as envisioned by Reed Montagu in his paper in 2002. And in that situation, we have already some uh, brain-computer interface papers, such as like the one by Duan, but uh, I think there is a, a, a quick talk after uh, talking about hyper neural feedback. So, um, so the technology is there, and it's a way also to have a loop and have a causal uh, intervention on uh, interbrain synchronization. Uh, with Quentin, we, we have worked more on how to use controlled human-machine interaction to have a, a, an understanding of the st structure and the mechanism underlying interbrain synchronization. So for instance, using this human dynamic claim that I developed with uh, 
Emmanuel Tonioli and Scott Kelso, where a human is coupled in real time with the computational model of a human, uh, we were able to show that the uh, right temporal parietal junction that was, uh, if you remember well, one of the hub of this interbrain synchronization is actually the, the brain region integrating self and other neural dynamics. Uh, so the two network that are associated with the ongoing uh, behavior of self and other are coordinated in RTPJ. So this interbrain synchronization may reflect that inside each brain, we have there uh, a tight integration of self and other behavior information, representation. And the last uh, solution that we propose to have more like logical causation through counter counterfactual demonstration, and uh, I, I amusingly use the no brain recording. So even without brains is to use computational model and mathematics. And so 2012, for instance, we did like the first demonstration of uh, in silico hyperscanning by simulating two connectome co uh, coupled through perception and action. So using DTI and uh, Kuramoto oscillators. And to make long story short, this computational model allowed us to show that the real connectivity, the, the anatomy of the human brain tend to facilitate interbrain synchronization. So the more you have this perception action loop, the more you get synchronization of the uh, brain activity between two human brain. While if you scramble and shuffle the connection, which is not possible in, in real brain, but could be done in, in silico hyperscanning, uh, you, you collapse this uh, propensity to synchronize, but you still have a residual synchronization, which is also a very important take home message because a lot of people are amazed to find interbrain synchronization. And it's not that surprising if you're recording two human brain that they tend to be synchronized, you just, uh, reflecting the fact that you are studying two similar systems. So it's the variation uh, in a design, in an experimental design that is interesting and not the interbrain synchronization alone that are interesting in multibrain neuroscience. Uh, so we demonstrate that then, then anatomical structure, uh, and it was already known like the entire individual scale, uh, the anatomy of the human brain facilitate integration and diversity of dynamics. But here we show that also it was kind of facilitating the perception action coupling between two people. And that's interesting because uh, since it was a model with distributed connectivity, uh, it showed that without having a specific brain region that is altered, uh, you can impair the ability of couple uh, in a dynamical way with other people. And uh, working also on autism, uh, one of the characteristic of the autistic brain, and so some people call it the idiosyncratic brain, is the strong heterogeneity across people with autism. And without having a specific brain area to pinpoint, uh, we can have like here an explanation of maybe alteration of the connectivity in a distributed way could impact the propensity to coordinate with others. So that's uh, that's all for now. Like.